Okay. Okay, so today it's me again, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chad Pod, who uh, graduated his PhD this semester. And thank you for being But I had the pleasure to co-advise with Dr. Kim Pocket from Anthropology and Environmental Microbiology. Yeah, so my name is Estelle, and I'm in Ecosystem Science and Management. Uh, so during uh, so Chad came to us from uh, University of California Davis, where he um, was doing a, a bachelor in science in biotechnology and got interested in doing things that were more applied to microbiome and agroecosystem. And he has you will see that this is his uh, kind of dissertation talk, so you will see all that he has done, uh, and he has done a lot of fantastic work, mostly in silico. So I won't through that a lot, but I want to highlight that he has also been a cornerstone member of the Microbiome Center and Microbiome Community because he is one of the founding uh, member and I serve as a president for a long time of the Microbes for Microbes Student Association. He's going to talk about a little bit about that, but one of the things that he has done for us is to uh, help us uh, get a grant through the Microbiome Center to get a fantastic microscope that he's going to talk about that is available for our community to use. Um, yeah. What else? Should I say something embarrassing? No. All right. Yes, yes, say something. Here is the microscope. Oh, wow. Can you put it back here? You can bring it up here. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah, so Chad, no, no time for embarrassing, but I just want to say that uh, he's, uh, he already has a postdoc, too late, I'm sorry, but uh, his postdoc is uh, with USDA and the CDC working on uh, modeling the spread of the whale nice birds, and so, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, and so, yeah, and so I think maybe there could be some other conversation happening besides the uh, bonus. And I, I have to run because I'm teaching, but uh, I saw that and I, I know it's an amazing talk, so enjoy. <laughs> oh yeah, so sorry. Hey. Here you <laughs> and I was very confused to have you part of the group. And I know we'll be in touch, so have fun. Okay, uh, so nice introduction. Uh, like Estelle said, I want to start by mentioning this microscope that Macrobes for Macrobes applied for and the Microbiome Center was uh, nice enough to fund for us. Uh, we, as part of the club, have a big influence or we have a big focus on outreach. And so we really wanted a microscope that was durable and easy to use and can travel well and uh, was just reliable. And so we found this uh, microscope, the Echo Rebel. It's uh, very cool. It has the, so here it is here very portable and it has a iPad on it. So everything is controlled through software. It's very intuitive. Like you hook it up, turn it on and like any viral can figure out how to use it within a couple of minutes. It's neat. Another neat thing is that you can just flip it upside down. So it can go from upright to inverted. So if you want to look at a hundred X and under oil immersion lens, you can do that. If you want to put a Petri dish with pond water and look at things swimming around, you can do that as well. Um, so far this year, we've used it at, at progress days. Here are a few pictures of people looking at it there. You can hook it up to a big screen TV for easy display. Everybody loves it. It's very fun. It's also been at the Great Insect Fair. It's been to multiple classrooms around campus. So if you want to use it, contact Estelle. She can uh, set it up for you. Um, I think that's all I have to say about that. Uh, we'll get it turned on if you want to play with it afterwards. <clears throat> But for today, I'm going to be giving my defense talk again, a little less formal because it's been about a month and I forgot all the things in my head that I said. Um, mm -hmm. So it's going to be more conversational and a little less like uh, very introductory material. Um, but the title of my dissertation was Competition and Virulence in Pseudomonas syringae. So the best way to start this, I think, is by introducing Pseudomonas syringae, since it is a plant pathogen, and talk about its relationship with kiwi. Uh, so kiwi is an interesting plant because it was only cultivated in the early 20th century, 1904 is first cultivation. And for about 80 years, we grew these green kiwis and they were nice and they were very popular. Um, but uh, around 2000, a company introduced this golden variety and it was sweeter. It was less acidic. Everybody liked it. It was like a premium kiwi. 
and it very quickly became 33% of the kiwi market in New Zealand, a very popular fruit. Unfortunately, in 2008, we first saw reports of a severe bacterial disease called bacterial canker on this cultivar caused by Pseudomonas syringi. Um, and it was first detected in Italy and then quickly in Japan and Korea throughout the world. It hadn't touched New Zealand yet, but everybody was very afraid of what would happen when it did because not only was kiwi grown everywhere in New Zealand, but the weather is so nice there that once it starts spreading, it has a long time to spread. So in 2010, uh, fears were realized and the disease finally snuck into the country. And from 2010 to 2012, this cultivar was completely decimated in the country. So we're talking about trillions of dollars lost in two years. And this isn't just like uh, an abstract trillions of dollars. This is farmers' entire orchards completely wiped out. Their land value dropped by 75%. And if you wanted to regrow mm -hmm. kiwi, you plant it and wait another four to five years for it to start producing fruit again. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. So why New Zealand? Uh, were other countries growing this at the same time as well? They, they were growing it, experience? and it was also, but it hit them particularly bad, so there's a lot of research on how okay. like the impacts of New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. So you do see this exact sort of thing to a slightly lesser extent in other countries that were grown. Okay. Um, so you can find golden kiwi still grown, um, but it's a less tasty version that's a little more resistant to the disease. Mm -hmm. So I bring up the story for two reasons. First is just to show how devastating Pseudomonas syringi can be as a pathogen when given the chance. Also just to show how uh, adaptive it is, how quickly it can go from uh, uh, not infecting a brand new cultivar to completely wiping it out less than a decade. So this ability to adapt to new hosts is also seen in the fact that basically every crop we grow is capable of infected by at least one strain of Pseudomonas syringi. And uh, this is why it's a important model organism for plant pathology. And so usually when we talk about pseudomonas syringi, we talk about it in terms of this disease, the symptoms, how it interacts with the plant. And it's really important to understand this, but actually by the time you see the disease, it's really too late uh, a lot of times. And it'd be nice if we can kind of focus earlier on and do preventative treatment. And so uh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time today talking about the very early stages of disease when the bacteria first lands on a leaf surface and tries to establish itself in this pretty harsh environment and how they compete with bacteria on the leaf surface. And if they're successful in this stage, eventually then start causing disease inside of them. So the first project I'm gonna talk about is focusing on this last stage where we see disease. We wanna know who exactly who's causing it and how concerned we should be about this pathogen. So I'll talk about the development of a tool and a website for plant pathologists to use to do this. And then I'm gonna jump all, jump all the way back to the beginning of the disease process and talk about um, bacteriosins, a toxin that are used by Pseudomonas syringi and many, many other bacteria to outcompete uh, sensitive or uh, competitors and invade new communities. And then I'm gonna dig even deeper into bacteriosins and look at some genomic diversity of these toxins and how they might be shaping population structure within pseudomonas syringi. Uh, so first, I want to introduce you a little bit to what I mean by pseudomonas syringi. We kind of say pseudomonas syringi as like one thing, but really it's a large group of pathogens made up of 15 different species um, and 13 different phyla groups that are based just on genomic relationships. And then if you look at their host range and symptomology, you can also use that to separate them out into 60 different pathophars. Uh, so what I show on the side of the screen here is a phylogenetic tree I built from all of the publicly available pseudomonas syringi genomes. Uh, this is a core genome phylogeny and it's colored by phyla groups. This is gonna be the way I'm gonna be talking about pseudomonas syringi because species designations as they are in public databases are a little bit iffy. Path of our designations don't line up with phylogeny because it's all based on phenotypes. And so phylo groups are kind of the most reliable way to talk about to syringi in the context of uh, a phylogeny. Uh, so one of the issues when you're identifying pseudomonas syringi is that even very closely related pathogens can have very different uh, disease outcomes. So what I'm showing here on the tree, oh, I can use this. This is where all of our major kiwi pathogens live. And I've kind of broken it out into uh, kind of all the biovars that live within this region. The 
important thing about these biovars is that they're all associated with very different uh, amounts of pathogenicity to kiwi. So you can see that you can have some that are very mildly pathogenic. And if you see it, you don't really need to manage it. Probably it'll probably just burn itself out before causing any damage. Whereas this blue plate, this is the one that devastated uh, the golden kiwi. And so depending on which one you have, you really want to change your management strategies. Uh, also, very many, many strains within Pseudomonas syringae cause disease on different plants or on the same plant, even though they're found throughout the tree. So what I'm showing here is a greenhouse study done by Cindy Morris in her lab, where they just took a bunch of pathogenic strains throughout the Pseudomonas syringae tree, tried to infect a bunch of different plants and saw if they caused disease. If I just draw your attention to tomato, you can see that over half of them cause some level of disease on tomato. So just seeing disease on tomato doesn't tell you anything really about what this pathogen might be. And this is also a problem if you want to try to predict where this pathogen might cause disease after it's done with tomato. If there's a pumpkin field nearby, will it be able to cause disease on that pumpkin? Kind of hard to say because if you look at some of the strains that cause disease on tomato, the host range and other plants can vary pretty dramatically. So another reason why we really want to make sure we know who we're talking about when we find a, a pathogen. So I'm not going to say too much about this other than the main way we do this is with marker gene sequencing. So we isolate bacteria and we sequence it. You can do whole genome sequencing, but there are drawbacks to that. It's expensive and for routine surveillance of pathogens, it's not really efficient or practical. So everybody usually does marker gene sequencing. And so the we're gonna focus on how can we make the output of marker gene sequencing uh, better for plant pathologists. And by better, I mean, how can we get better resolution that's more on par with whole genome sequencing? And then can we, just with the marker gene sequence, start to predict what virulence factors that uh, pathogen might be carrying? Uh, so 16S does not work for Pseudomonas syringae just because it doesn't have enough resolution. And so over the years, plant pathologists have looked at many different housekeeping genes and developed many different primer sets to try to uh, be able to identify what strain we're looking at. And going through the literature, I found 16 different primer sets that are targeting eight different genes. And the first part of this project is going to be looking at those primer sets and just seeing which one uh, might be the best cat or candidate for building classifiers. So I'm doing this all in silico. All of these primer sets have been tested uh, in actual PCR reactions. They've been used for a while. So we know that practically they work. The main questions I want to ask are, uh, when we look at uh, the genome set that we have, how well do they perform in silico against a lot of our genomes? So how well can they amplify throughout the tree? And the answer to that is that some of them do very, very well, and some do very, very poorly. So, so everything in blue had over 90% amplification throughout the tree. And uh, there are some that dropped off considerably. There's actually one here that I had no amplification at all. I think there might have actually been a typo in the manuscript. And that's the issue for that. But the main difference between the ones that did well and that didn't do well is uh, the ones that did well have a lot of redundancy built into their sequencing or into their primer sequences. So this allows them to be... Uh, uh, have less mass matches, basically. Why can you use to be able to test it? So it's just a script called in silico PCR. It literally just is a fancy control F. It looks for, you can say, how big of an epicon you want, how many mass matches, and then it just goes and tries to find regions that match. The second thing I wanted to look at, it's nice to be able to, uh, to actually generate an amplicon, but if that Amplicon doesn't represent the diversity that you see in the whole genome, then it's not super uh, useful. And so uh, what I did was I took all the genomes that I have, calculated pairwise A and I, and then took the differences between the amplicons from those genomes. And ideally those should line up perfectly. So genomes that are very similar should have am ampli amplicons that are very similar. Genomes that are very different should have amplicons that are very different. You can plot it out like this, and ideally, it would fall right along that diagonal line. Uh, these are my uh, worst and my best results. Um, the one that's in fine is fine. It's fine. Um, but it 
means that it might have issues if we find a pathogen that we don't have a good reference for in our data set. It might not be able to accurately classify it. And kind of interestingly, this one is labeled as fine. It did the worst out of all of them. This is the one in the literature right now that is being kind of propped up as a one that is the gold standard. So maybe in some ways it's not the gold standard. Uh, but I still moved everything from that test on. So I ended up with nine primer sets that seemed to work out okay. I was actually going to build classifiers now for each of them and see how they perform and classification models. So it's a classification model. The goal is you throw in an epigon sequence, magic happens in a classification model, and it spits out some output from where it belongs in the tree. Uh, typically, so I use a naive Bayes classifier for this. The typical input for training these is taxonomic data. So you feed in family genus species, and then when you feed in your unknown, it'll output the result family genus species. There are two issues with this. One is what I kind of already mentioned, is that the taxonomic labels in the public data set are not super reliable. So you have pretty poor reliability, and this means that your model accuracy is going to go down. Um, the second issue is that a lot of the really interesting diversity that we want is below the species level. We don't have any real nomenclature below the species level to feed into the model to train it. So taxonomic information is not a good way to train models if we really want to get the most resolution out of our primer sets. So what I did instead was I clustered everything just by the genomic similarity, put them in these nested hierarchical buckets, and then kind of tricked the naive base classifiers to use this as a taxonomy to train it. And then it spits out an output like this where you have hierarchical clusters. And so when I did this, uh, the results for all nine of my primer sets actually did very well. So the anything that's blue is below species resolution, which is great. That's better than the taxonomic data that we have right now. And anything yellow and red is worse. So uh, yeah, you can see there's some issues where uh, some primer sets don't do well, but for the most part, the average resolution was about 97 to 98% A and I um, clustering. And just for reference, 95 to 96% is species level resolution. <clears throat> kind of interestingly, all of them perform almost identically. And when I concatenated multiple marker gene sequences trying to improve this resolution, I was unable to. So I think that these housekeeping genes that are great for being able to amplify broadly throughout the species complex, just have a limited resolution, just because all of the interesting gene transfer happening that separates them is kind of lost at that level. So I think this is kind of the maximum level of resolution with marker gene sequencing for serene. So these classification models do represent the most accurate method for identifying pseudomonas syringi strains from Anthon data. Um, and it brings up the next question now is, is it good enough to actually predict virulence factors that pathogens might be carrying? So what I used effector proteins as my virulence factors to test this. Effector proteins are just proteins carried by pathogens. They're directly injected through the type 3 secretion system into the host. They manipulate the host by causing it to release nutrients or water, anything that helps out. And the ultimate goal for every effector protein is just to make it easier for the pathogen to grow and cause disease. Uh, so the specific combination of effectors the pathogen carries plays a very important role for host range because plants can actually recognize effectors and shut down the disease. And um, when pathogens carry five to 50 effector proteins, this means that it acts as a um, kind of a barrier for disease in some cases. So what I did was I took 113 new genomes that were not part of my training data set for my classifiers, fed them through, classified them, and then looked at all the genomes in this little cluster that they were classified in and saw um, what effectors they had. If more than 50% of the genomes in this cluster had a certain effector protein, then I would just predict that my unknown had that effector. Otherwise, I'd say it wasn't there. Uh, in all, I looked at 77 effectors, and the results on the next slide are going to be reported in the percent of this total repertoire that was accurately predicted. So these are the overall results. Uh, overall, there was a 92% accuracy in effector protein or effector repertoire, um, but this is kind of misleading because it varies dramatically by phylum and what strains you're actually looking at. 
So we looked at kind of the best performing, and sorry for not describing this. So this is broken down by phyla groups. And then all we hear is just the percent of vectors uh, correctly predicted. Uh, the ones that did the best are phyla groups seven and 13. These are secondary phyla groups. They're not really the main pathogens of concern for the most part. They carry four to five effector proteins. And so it makes sense that these are the easiest ones to predict. They're fairly stable, small repertoires. On the other end, we have a uh, final group 1B. These are very virulent pathogens. And these are Kiwi pathogens. We had the hardest time predicting these just because they're undergoing a lot of evolution, mm -hmm. a lot of transfer effector proteins. Um, and so it means that in some cases, this might be a good strategy for predicting effector proteins, but for our kind of more aggressive uh, pathogens, marker gene sequencing and then predicting effector proteins might not be the best way to go. Okay, so I have the classifiers and I have a way to somewhat predict effector proteins. Uh, I wanted to make it as easy as possible for plant pathologists to use the classifiers. And so I created syringi.org where you can just submit your amplicon sequences for the supported primer sets. And what you output is a uh, phylogenetic placement within the tree uh, with kind of confidence around it labeled in uh, brown. And then all of the phyla groups, species, and pathophars are within that tree. So you can kind of translate back into all of this nomenclature that we are so familiar with. And then on the bottom is a distribution of all of the type three effector proteins that are found in the closely related strains. So you can go through and say, okay, these are the effectors that they probably have. What does that mean for the host that I care about and the system that I care about at the moment? And so my goal for this now is that it just makes it a little simpler for plant pathologists to go through, isolate bacteria, uh, sequence their amplicons, and then just submit it to syringa.org and not have to worry about all their pipeline stuff. But there are uh, other goals. Um, type three effectors are not the only effect or virulence factors that pathogens have. So adding support for all virulence factors in the pseudomonas syringa would be great. Um, a really big goal for this is to collect metadata when people upload amplicon sequences. The goal is to provide a useful tool for plant pathologists, but this data that they're inputting are routine amplicon sequences. And if you find an amplicon sequence that's already published, you're not gonna publish it anywhere. So it's kind of lost data possibly. And if we use a tool that allows them to analyze it easily, we can collect metadata and this can be used later for epidemiological purposes, just understanding interactions between pathogens. So I think using this as kind of a data collection tool in itself is a big, a big goal. Also extend it to whole genome analysis for the pathogens that it doesn't work out for. Okay, so now I'm jumping straight from that into something that um, is, yes. Question about that section. Yeah. So when you have the marker genes predict virulence, are you using sort of one marker gene at a time for accuracy predictions? Or yeah. using all of them as like a multi locus sequence typing. Yeah, so I didn't clarify this too much. So I, I just looked at um, all 77 effector proteins that I looked at. And for each one, I predicted do they have it, do they not? And then how many of those predictions I got correct was the value per. Was point. that based on one marker gene or multiple marker genes lumped together? It's, step, it's oh, oh, for like the classification and everything? Yeah. It was just for one. So if you grouped, if I understand correctly, if you grouped your multi-locus sequence typing system all together, maybe that would improve accuracy. It, it doesn't, oh. surprisingly. Okay. Yeah. So I, that's where I say, I think it is limited just in that the housekeeping genes don't yeah. evolve as enough. There's not enough diversity there to catch all of this gene transfer that's happening. That's interesting in and of itself. Yeah. Are you classifying them within the phylotypes into sequence types as well? Is that something you thought about? Or is the phylotype your sequence type? What do you mean by sequence? So let's say you have a nucleotide substitution and it's the same amplicon. So then you'd have sequence type one, sequence type two under the same phylotype. And that way you can track the evolution. I mean, I kind of just use the output from the base classifier, mm -hmm. which literally just puts it into a bin of genomes. And so it's kind of abstract and it doesn't print out the uh, like the amplicon sequence, the unknown amplicon sequence, and then all of those that are classified with. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have that resolution at the moment. It is something that I would like to do in the future just because it's 
more informative. But right now, do I'm just doing straight up. Foodborne pathogens, they do that kind of stuff for MPCOM a lot. So it's, okay. yeah, the tools are already available. Okay, next step then. Mm -hmm. so. Chat. Are most of the effector virulence genes in phages, plasmids, mobile, and kind of stuff, or are they distributed they're, equally? They're in the chromosome. They can be in phages, which I'll talk about a little bit. Okay. Cool. Yeah, most of them are just in the chromosome. All right. Okay, so let's jump all the way to the beginning of the process and hopefully learn some stuff that can stop us from getting to this point where we're actually causing disease and try to figure out ways to stop it at this earlier stage. Uh, so when bacteria land on a leaf, usually it happens through wind, rain, there's a lot of ways that can happen. Um, they're faced with an environment that looks like this. This is our trichomes. And then if you look at the kind of carpet of the um, leaf surface, all these cells form these big valleys, intracellular grooves. Um, these are really important features for bacteria because uh, trichomes release secondary metabolites. And then when they break off, the scars are thinner. So uh, glucose kind of leaches through. So what you end up with this is the patchiness on the leaf surface where you get these 10 to 100,000 uh, cell aggregates at the base of trichomes. And then you can see that they also kind of fall into these grooves and between cells where nutrients like to collect. So this is kind of the environment that they find themselves in. Um, and surviving in this environment is very important for the pathogen because the epiphytic population of the pathogen correlates very, very strongly with the disease severity within a few days. So we can kind of tamp down on population growth on the leaf surface. It bodes well for uh, disease outcome. So what I'm showing here is just a simple experiment where the, they inoculated a leaf surface with some bacteria and then waited and saw how much disease it was caused in a few days. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is that these numbers, uh, log four and five CFU, these correlate to a single one of those aggregates at the base of a trichome. So it doesn't take much uh, of the population boom to actually cause a big increase in disease severity. And this kind of measure here, disease severity, is measured in the percentage of a leaf that is covered in lesions from the pathogen at day five. So it's a big boom. And so I'm going to be talking about how bacteria try to increase their ability to uh, survive on the leaf surface with this mysterious title, Solution to the Paradox of Decision Bacteriosin Production. First, I want to introduce what bacteriosins are. Bacteriosins are, so let me do a bit of time. Uh, so bacteriosins are a very, very common toxin cause uh, carried by bacteria. They're found in about 90% 90, 90 of bacteria surveyed, um, and most syringi strains carry more than one. So, there are multiple killing mechanisms for bacteriosins. If we imagine this is our bacteriosin producer with the bacteriosins, they can form pores, our degraded cell wall, degrade DNA. Um, one thing that they all have in common though is that they often require the producing cell to actually uh, kill itself, lyse itself to release the toxin into the environment. And so it's thought that this is a very heavy fitness cost for the population. And it introduces a question that many, many uh, microbial ecologists looking at this have asked, and that is how and when is this behavior actually worth it? How can you get away with killing yourself? And kind of the standard answer right now is that uh, bacteriosin production is directly linked to DNA damage. So a cell uh, experiences DNA damage, it activates the SOS response, which first tries to repair the DNA, uh, and then if that doesn't work out, it slows down replication, trying to buy it some time, and then eventually it gives up and just kills itself. Uh, and so the idea is that this lytic bacteriosin release is somewhere in between these steps, and they're saying, hey, I know things are bad, it's not going to work out for me, I might as well do one last thing for my kin and release these bacteriosins into the environment. Chad, would another view of that be, though, that the phage activity or relic phage activity is just responding physiologically to a dying bacterial cell. So these ancient phage-related genes, if the bacteriosins are from there, I presume they are. So some, some of the 
the ones that I'm going to be talking about later in the next chapter are phage derived, but a lot of bacteriosins are just proteins. They're and, not phage related in this case. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so many bacteriosins, even when they're not related to phage at all, they still require lysis to release. Uh, so, yeah, so this is kind of like the current view. You're damaged, you kill yourself. It kind of, it kind of balances out, makes sense. Um, recently, there's been a couple papers actually where they just grew E. coli by themselves and they saw that even kind of under these nice laboratory conditions, you still see that there's a small percentage of the population that's highly expressing bacteriosins and eventually killing themselves. So this is just GFP uh, marking bacteriosin expression. If you look at different bacteriosins that E. coli carries, this happens fairly often, just at kind of different rates. So this is proportion of the population at a given time that is highly expressing bacteriosins. So it's kind of strange and it seems to counter counteract kind of this, this view that it's only when they're highly stressed are bacteria cells actually releasing bacteriosins. So what could possibly explain this? Um, so my hypothesis was just that maybe laboratory conditions are more stressful than people are appreciating and it is just DNA damage. Um, and so another way to say this is that a constitutive expression, and when I say constitutive production, is going to be at a population level. It's not that everyone is producing it. Um, and this is something that's expected when they're growing in a genotoxic environment. So first question I'm going to try to answer is, can damage-induced bacteriosin regulation result in constitutive production? And then if this is the case, let's kind of throw them into communities and see what the consequences this are if the strategy is for community dynamics. And the way I'm going to be doing this is with a, an agent-based model. It's a modeling strategy where instead of uh, looking at, a, at the population level with differential equations, you model the behavior of individual cells um, and kind of let population dynamics emerge from that. So I'm going to be uh, thinking back to this 10 to 100,000 cell little aggregate at the base of a trichome. And we're going to be trying to model that. So my model takes place in a 200 by 200 lattice. Each individual cell in the lattice can hold a single bacterial cell. Uh, in total, it's about 25,000 bacteria. This lattice has nutrients for the bacteria to grow and also has a constant DNA damage rate that they're experiencing. Uh, overall, I'm going to be looking at three different populations. There's a producing population. There's a population that's 100% sensitive to the bacteriosin when they encounter it, and then a population that's 100% resistant to the bacteriosin when they encounter it. So the very basic overview of how the model works is that you have an individual cell, they have two traits, they have a certain amount of replication energy that they're trying to build up, they have a certain amount of DNA damage that accumulates, and these things are directly influenced by the nutrients and the DNA damage from the environment. If a cell's energy reaches a certain threshold, it's able to replicate. And importantly, this DNA damage is diluted to its daughter cells. And if a cell's damage reaches a certain threshold, it just dies. So there's a lot going on here that you might have questions about, and I hope people ask questions about. Um, but I'm going to just briefly say that this is how the behavior works. And so just as an example, if you imagine the DNA damage creeps up, once it reaches a threshold, it just dies. This is for a non-bacteriosin producer. For bacteriosin producers, I put this threshold for death lower. I try different thresholds. And so they die earlier, but when they do, they release bacteriosins. And so again, can damage-induced bacteriosin uh, production result in constitutive uh, production? Uh, first way I'm going to test this is I'm going to try to recapitulate the results from those two studies where they basically just took E. coli group by themselves in a healthy little environment. So we're going to grow bacteria subproducers by themselves, track their population size and their production rate. And there are two possible outcomes that we might see. Um, the first is, if my hypothesis is correct, and that using damage-induced production results in this low production rate, we might see that population actually does very well, seems fairly healthy from the outside. But if you look at its, or its production rate, it stays at a slow, steady rate over the course of the simulation. Alternatively, if I'm wrong, you could see that uh, the population just crashes from all the DNA damage that it's experiencing. Production rate kind of skyrockets and everything crashes. 
What we do see, however, is that uh, if you take bacteria and producers, grow them by themselves, population very quickly grows, which is carrying capacity, oscillates around carrying capacity, and then stabilizes. And if you look at production rate, you see a very similar dynamic where um, in line with these oscillations, production rate kind of goes uh, uh, back and forth, and it centers around this value of about 0 0.6. So what this means is that at any given time point, so each for this time here, this represents about a minute in the simulation. So every minute, uh, about 0.6% of the population is lysing themselves and releasing bacteriosis into the environment. If we uh, alter the threshold for uh, death and release of bacteriosins, it doesn't alter these dynamics too much. We see that uh, since purple represents these dynamics, if we increase the threshold, then we still get about 5%, 5 to 6% of uh, population license self at any one time. This is very much in line with the values that we saw experimentally, where there's a small value um, in all bacteriosins. And so if we assume that this kind of model is correct, uh, let's see what the consequences are when we're trying to uh, compete these bacteriosal producers against an actual uh, simulated community. So again, thinking about this little patch, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to grow non-producers, either resistant or sensitive or a mix of them, and I'm going to let them kind of stabilize their population dynamics, and then I'm going to add in just a few cells of bacteriosal producers and see if they're able to invade or not. When I did that, the simplest result um, was uh, when the amount of damage in the environment was fairly low and bacteria and producers very quickly just took over. It was not really, uh, I mean, there's not much to say about it, it's simple. But when you increase, <laughs> that's what we expect, right? Uh, when you, what's kind of interesting is that when you increase the amount of stress in the environment, it really hinders the ability of the producer to invade. So this means that even when you have all of your competitors surrounding you 100% sensitive to your toxin, uh, if you have too much stress and that kind of, that little bit of uh, decrease in your threshold for death, it might introduce a fitness cost that makes it untenable to actually invade. So it's not just the competitive environment, but the abiotic environment that's influencing the success of bacteriosin production. Uh, another surprising result was that this was supposed to be just kind of a negative control. Let's throw producers in against resistant population and see that they don't invade, but they kind of do invade slowly. And so um, it's kind of mysterious because resistance, they aren't killed at all by bacteriosins. Producers are killing themselves earlier, so they should not be doing that well. But when you look at the actual dynamics of bacteriosin production, you start to get some hints of what's going on. So if you, if you remember back to bacteriosal producers growing by themselves, we had like a very low stable production rate um, of bacteriosins. Whereas in this case, you have these massive spikes uh, and dips in production. And I think this is kind of what's driving the ability to invade. Um, so if we line up these big spikes in production, you can see that they cause the producing population to dip down quite a bit. But immediately after these big spikes in production, where all of the most damaged cells are being uh, kind of wiped out, um, they're able to kind of stabilize and um, maintain their population size, even while the resistance are crashing due to kind of uh, overshooting carrying capacity. So I think what's happening here, um, not exactly sure, is that we're, we're kind of cooling the weakest cells in the population, diverting all of our resources to the most healthy cells, and this allows for a little bit of resilience in the future for the population. So overall, the ability, so adding in kind of an explicit damage-induced production to bacteriosins, um, it kind of solves this uh, paradox in a way and suggests that maybe genotoxic stress are more common than we think, and it means that we should kind of measure these things when we're doing studies in the lab, uh, and make sure that we're accounting for these abiotic factors that we know are regulating bacterial cell production. The second thing is that um, bacterial cell producers can successfully invade resistant competitors under my model. And so maybe this, uh, this lysis associated with bacterial cell production isn't as much of a fitness cost as we think. It might, in fact, be a benefit. Um, so even though they were able to invade, though, 
it is nice if the bacteria bacteriosis releasing are able to kill sensitive cells. Obviously, they did much better. And so, uh, for my last project, how much time do I have? Okay, not much. So, my last project, what I did was some uh, genomic uh, studies into uh, talosins, which are a certain type of bacteriosin, and I looked at their ability or their um, tail fibers, which determine killing in their. Okay, so uh, talosins, and quick introduction, talosins are derived from phages. Um, and so if you look at them, they look very structurally similar. They have tail fibers, they have a base plate, they have a tail tube. They are uh, definitely missing a capsid. They don't have DNA. They don't affect cells. They just kill them. And the way that these came about, we think, is that just a bacteriophage infected a cell, a bound to the cell surface, usually uh, with uh, by attaching to the LPS or the O antigen of LPS, they infect. There's a lytic cycle, but we think this happens in the lysogenic cycle where there's a prophage that forms, and sometimes things go wrong with prophages. They lose genes, they become inactive phages. And if you lose your capsid and ability to package DNA, you might end up with something that looks like a tail cell. Right? This is the basic idea that these come about. And we know that Pseudomonas syringae carries a tail cell. Not only do they carry talosin, but they have one talosin that uh, has very distinct killing spectra. So what I'm showing here is a kind of an all-by-all -all killing assay with talosins on the left from many different strains of Pseudomonas syringae, um, trying to kill other strains of Pseudomonas syringae. You see a green box, that means it was able to kill it. White means it wasn't. Ignore all the other colored boxes for now. What I really want to point out is that there are two very distinct uh, kind of groups of killing spectra here. So anything labeled with a two looks fairly similar to, similar to each other, and they're markedly different from uh, those in killing class one. These different killing classes and talosins correspond directly to these tail fiber genes that we see. So tail fibers, again, are what bind to the LPS. And if you actually look at a gene tree of tail fibers for all of these, they cluster out into two very clear plates. So killing class one, killing class two. Uh, the goal of this project was to expand on this a little bit more. This is about 60 strains. I have about 2,000 strains or genomes. So let's try to see if we can find more diversity here and figure out uh, kind of what's going on more with this pattern. So three specific aims, determine the full diversity of tail fibers using genomic methods. Because we live in the age of AI, let's use AlphaFold to try to predict protein structures and see if they're, how different these different tail fibers actually are, and then propose some possible drivers of tail fiber distribution within the species complex. Uh, so using my 2000 genomes that I used in the first chapter, actually, uh, we can go through and say, let's look for any tail fiber genes that look like the ones we've seen before. And let's also look at the region where talosins always tend to be within pseudomonas syringae and see if there are any new tail fibers that we just have missed. So my basic strategy, and in doing so, I was able to expand these little trees of tail fibers into these bigger trees of tail fibers. Around the outside are just the file group designations where they came from. It's not too important for this. Um, but what's interesting is that um, I uncovered a lot more diversity than we previously knew. So anything in blue here is represented just in this tiny little slice of this tree. Anything in pink is in this slice here. So what's going on in the rest of it? Um, so the first thing I did was, like I said, we know where this talosin lives. It lives in between trip D, trip B, and trip G. So if we look for these, we can kind of say, okay, any tail fiber with those nearby is almost certainly our talosin. Anything without these nearby is not our talosin. So that means all of these most likely are not our talosin. They might be a talosin somewhere else in the genome or there's something else entirely. Second thing I did was look to see, well, maybe these tail fibers are just prophages and that tends to be, or that turned out to be the case. So all of these with the red bands around it, these are capsid and DNA packaging genes. And so this suggests that a lot of these are not associated with talosins at all, they're just prophages along with this one over here. So I went through, poked through all the sequences, assigned plates to them, and overall, um, this is kind of like the landscape of tail fibers within Pseudomonas syringae as we see it right now. Um, this clay that we knew about before is a, what I'm calling type 1A. 
This clade that we knew before, I'm gonna call it type two. There's a new clade that's only found in this one vital group that's closely related um, that I'm calling type 1B, and then there's a type 3. So these are our four main tail ascent associated tail fibers that I'll be talking about for the rest of this bit. Um, and then there's also these prophages that are fairly closely related to the type 1 fibers. Uh, there is this type 3 fiber as well um, that I will, I will be discussing. But for the most part, this is kind of the landscape with type 1B and type 3 being our new diversity. So what do these actually look like? It's hard to kind of get a picture of what they look like just with genomic data. Protein structures are always fun to look at, so let's look at them. So if we look at, um, so I went through and built protein structures for representatives from each of these clades, and it turns out they all basically look like this. So I'm showing one representative structure that is a good representative of all of these. To orient yourself on what you're looking at, I have this nice little cartoon up here. This is the part that binds to the base plate, and it sticks out from there. And I colored the protein. Um, red is um, greater sequence diversity or amino acid diversity. Red or white is highly conserved. And so you can see that there's this really strong gradient where the farther down the tail you get, the more diversity it is. Um, you can also notice that there are these knobs that repeat. And a lot of the hotspots of diversity lay in these knobs, especially the later ones. Um, so I think the best way to interpret this is just that if the tail ascent is landing on a target cell, these are the ones that are almost always gonna be encountering it first. And if any of the knobs up here are encountering, encountering LPS, these ones are also gonna be encountering it. So it's just more likely that these are encountering it. So they're gonna be hot spots for that um, I think there's mostly what I wanna say. One thing that's interesting is that all of these repeats, these are homologous repeats. So there might be some redundancy here that allows for rapid evolution. So you can kind of say, okay, I can stay safe and target certain LPS structures here and alter this without completely breaking everything. If we look at type two and type three tail fibers, which are in my other tree, again, orient for how they um, attach to the tail fiber or the telicin, they look very, very different. They're very short, they're very stubby. Um, and the pattern of conservation is not nearly as clear. They're kind of sporadic throughout it. And it's kind of hard for me to say too much of what's going on here, um, except for the fact that they are different. One thing I'll point out is if you draw a line kind of through these and through these, these are exactly the same. So this base plate uh, attachment point is very, very important for uh, associating with telescents. And everything else beyond this is all just receptor binding stuff. Uh, so I'm calling these, actually, I didn't think I called it here, but this is a long tail fiber. This is a short tail fiber. Those are not just qualitative names. These are really important functionally for uh, talosins and for prophages. Um, if we look at a prophage or a bacteriophage again, you see that there's these long tail fibers and these short tail fibers. These play very distinct roles during infection. The long ones are kind of the first point of attachment and they're reversible binding. So they allow the phage to kind of walk along, find the best place to attach. And then once all six tail fibers attach, it triggers a conformational change in the base plate. It lowers down. And then these short tail fibers uh, are what kind of really lock on. And they allow it to kind of uh, stay put where all while it infects and uh, inserts its DNA. So this reversible and irreversible binding is really interesting when we see them associated with telosins and brings up questions about how this impacts the uh, infection dynamics of the toxin particle. Uh, so first of all, does it even hold true in telosins? Have they been associated with telosins long enough where this difference in binding affinity has changed? Um, but if it, it does stay the same, then it might impact the dynamics of infection. Because you can imagine if you just had these uh, irreversible binding short tail fibers, if you stick into a spot that is not ideal, you might not be able to kill as well. But if you happen to land on a really nice spot for infection, then you're really locked on and might uh, be more efficient at killing. So this is like a, a, a future direction for investigating the difference here. I want to point out that this is kind of a new finding for talosins. We don't really, before this, think about what the differences in tail fibers are. So it kind of uh, adds a new dynamic to uh, killing dynamics. And we do know that some talosins are more efficient than others at killing. So this might in part explain that. 
Okay, so those are all the tail fibers. Let's look at how they actually uh, are found in the species complex. This is the distribution of the short tail fibers, type two and three. These are all of our big pathogens. These are secondary pathogens that we don't, uh, they don't cause as much problems. And one thing you'll notice is that uh, for the type two tail fibers, there's this really interesting pattern where some phyla groups, they're the only tail fiber that they have associated with talosin, and they're just not present at all in some phyla groups. And there's this big clade here where it's kind of chaos. There's a lot of switching back and forth between type two and three. And this is mirrored when you add on the long tail fibers. So clades that don't have, or phyla groups that don't have the type two, typically have a type one A. And then this holds true in this big chaotic group of strains where it's kind of switching throughout. One really interesting thing, if we think back to the prophage fibers, prophage fibers have a distribution that mirrors almost identically the type two tail fibers. So if you have a tail stem with the type two tail fibers, you're much more likely to have this prophage with a type one like tail fiber. Um, so what might be causing this? Because obviously phylogenetic patterns alone aren't enough to describe it. It's not just vertical transfer. Um, so my uh, guess was this came from uh, Dave Boltress's preprint that was just released a few months ago, actually, where he found that sensitivity to telosins is highly correlated with this gene RFBD. This is a um, ramnosynthesis gene that's really important for LPS structure. And so if you look at this gene tree of RFBD, within Sumona syringi, you get it breaks out in these two very distinct clades and they're colored by sensitivity to different talosins for the strain that carries it. So what this means is that if you carry a certain RFBD gene, it changes the structure of your LPS structure and then in turn, this changes your affinity or ability to be attacked by a certain talosin. So my question was just, is this pattern of RFBD also just uh, kind of explain the distribution pattern of the tail sins themselves in the genes. So what I did was I built my own RFBD gene tree from all my 2000 genomes. And then I mapped the co-occurrence of tail, type, tail fiber types onto that tree. And so what you get is the same RFBD gene tree, flipped it over just to make it fit. You can see the two distinct clades again. And you see that for the most part, if you have one type of RFBD, you're much more likely to have the type 1A tail fiber. If you have the other, you're much more likely to have type two. Interestingly, even though 1A and 1B are structurally similar, the 1B fiber is more associated with an RFBD gene over here. Type three tail fibers are a different beast. They're very rare and they're kind of sporadic throughout it. Suggest so maybe they're binding to something different than LPS or a different part of LPS. And again, you see the same pattern with the prophage uh, fibers. So I'm hurrying along as fast as I can. Um, the uh, takeaway from this, the broad overview is that pseudomonas syringi strains carry different alleles of RFDD. This in turn changes their structure of LPS. And it paints this picture where there's kind of reciprocal killing between two different types or two different populations maybe of pseudomonas syringi that defies phylogenetic relationships. Some of them have the type 1A long tail fiber, some have the type 2 short tail fiber. Um, and then they have interesting characteristics with themselves. And then there's also this interesting pattern where if you carry a type two fiber, you're much more likely to have this phage with a type one light tail fiber on your associated with you. This brings up dynamics with maybe it's expanding the killing range where the talosin can kill uh, one type of competitor, whereas the phage can kill more closely related competitors. It also is interesting going back to Seth's point, prophages can carry genes with them that are useful for their hosts. And so if this bacterial phage actually infects a competitor and becomes a prophage, it might also be carrying effector proteins with it and actually enhance its survival. And so there might be interesting things happening just circulating around these different populations defined by RFBD that we're kind of just now exploring. Overall, uh, Sumo syringi is not just a pathogen, has a very complicated amount of stresses and challenges it must face. There's amniotic stresses and competitors the microbial world on the in the phylosphere, and then it has to compute with the plant. And uh, they're all connected to each other. It's all very important. Uh, and hopefully there's time for one or two questions. I want to thank my committee. I want to thank uh, Kevin and Estelle for letting me ask weird questions with uh, methods that uh, none of us had any familiar with. I want to thank Microbiome Center. 
uh, in Biome Initiative, which I was part of the first cohort, and I think we're all kind of finishing up now. And then Penn State, uh, up, Sarah, everybody. And thank you. We do have time for one or two questions. Um, anybody has questions? We do like to start first with a trainee. Um, when you were looking at the, the presence of capsid and DNA uh, control genes, I think, I'm wondering, um, do you know if they're necessarily expressed? I don't. So that is like a next thing you have. I ran the genomes through faster and it predicted it as a intact phage, but we haven't gone through and done like the lab work to make sure that it actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just thinking about concepts of lysis and um, you know the illusion, the alluding to that there might be some altruistic behavior of the killing process, but you know, just to critique and challenge that a little bit, you could imagine that there might be a, a selfish gene component to this kind of thing where the bacteriocin is launching its own product when its host cell is dying to then kill other neighboring cells, which thereby decreases their frequency of those genes. And there might be some parallels between altruism and the selfish gene kind of concept, but you know, it frames it in a slightly different angle. What do you, have you thought about that? Yeah, it's hard to, I don't know how to untangle the two, just because, I mean, yeah. the telosin is in the main chromosome of the bacteria. So I kind of like, everybody's success is intertwined with each other. Yeah. Um, and like, they're not infectious particles. So it definitely is. I guess it just depends on what perspective you want to. Look it does. At. It does a lot. Yeah, and to have both perspectives is kind of um, ground zero, right? Like that, you can think about what for your personal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. success is the bacteria success, and bacteria success is the Taylorson success. Mm -hmm. So it is.